Hi there, everyone. Uh, I'm Clark Cahill, events manager with the South China Morning Post. Thank you all for being here with us for the very first segment in our new digital transformation series, uh, during which our panelists will be discussing the future of cybersecurity after COVID-19. Before we jump into things, we need to give a big thanks to our sponsors for their generous support, including our gold sponsors, the Qianhai International Liaison Services Limited, as well as Microsoft. As the pandemic has revealed myriad shortcomings within organizations across industry sectors, particularly when it comes to business continuity plans and risk management, it's proven that cybersecurity is an organization-wide responsibility and not only an IT issue. Here to discuss how organizations across sectors can improve their cybersecurity infrastructure are Mickey Lowe, Managing Director and Chief Information Risk Officer for APAC with BNY Mellon, Sam Coco, who's Head of Information Security and Technology Risk for Asia Pacific at Fidelity International, Dr. Lucas Hui, who's the Chief Technology Officer at Astri, and Harry Poon, who's a Cybersecurity Executive executive for the Cybersecurity Solutions Group at Microsoft Greater China. The session will be moderated by Bien Perez, who's a senior production editor for the technology desk at the South China Morning Post. Before I pass things over to Bien, I want to make our audience aware that we'll be reserving time at the end of this session for audience Q&A. We'll be accepting and encouraging you to submit questions to our panelists throughout the course of this session. You can do so by using the Q&A function on the WebEx platform. Submit your question at any point throughout the chat and we'll, be sh we'll do our best to get your question over to our panelists in the amount of time that we have. Without further ado, I'll pass things over to Bien to begin the discussion. Good morning to all and uh, welcome to this latest edition of uh, this webinar for digital, for digital transformation. And I'm very honored to speak with these uh, gentlemen today who are all uh, at the top of the field in cybersecurity. First off, uh, sir, can we start with uh, sort of an explanation or on the state of cybersecurity in your respective organizations? Can we start with Mickey, please? Okay, uh, thank you, Bian. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to be um, here and sharing um, experiences that I have had in uh, at BNY Mellon. Um, I um, let me just a brief introductions of my responsibility. I look after um, information risk at BNY Mellon in Asia Pacific. Um, they cover the entire Asia Pacific region from Japan down to Australia and from Taiwan to, uh, to India as well. Uh, that's how we define Asia Pacific at BNY Mellon. Um, and uh, uh, and I and I emphasize information risk because we have fully implemented three lines of defense model. Uh, first line being technology and the CISO, uh, and I'm in second line of defense, uh, mainly risk or governance and oversight, uh, and interface and interactions with regulators. So a chunk of my work, I would say a big chunk of my work is really to look at all the regulations um, in the APEC regions to make sure that we are in compliance with them, uh, in addition to our internal policies and so forth. Um, so my, my biggest challenge, is, as you would expect, uh, being a global organization, at least in the APEC region, we have seven branches in seven countries, uh, and each country has at least two regulators, uh, bank regulators and securities. Uh, and so we can imagine dealing with or handling 14 regulators is a challenge. Uh, and in the recent two years, um, the, the regulation issuance from those regulators is like a uh, Olympic game. Uh, if you see Regulator 1 issuing, publish one regulation today, you'll be sure that Regulators 2, 3, and 4, and 5 will have a catch-up and so forth. Uh, and, and they talk to one another, and there's a, a you know, a, a Regulator College that they share information, which is great. Uh, and unfortunately, we have not seen yet that there's a convergence in terms of requirements. So a regulation from a Regulator may be different from another Regulator and so forth, and that creates a lot of you know, a, a challenge for us in terms of ensuring compliance. So what we are doing right now is really uh, undertaking exercise uh, to map all those regulations into a common control framework so that we can then navigate for given control how many regulations you are addressing. 
and vice versa. So we can, we can do things smart by focusing on control that we can have a bigger return on investment as opposed to looking at specific regulatory control and so forth. So that's what we're doing right now. And, and then, of course, the COVID-19 uh, has imposed additional challenges to us because of the work from home environment. Now we're all here with WebEx, uh, which is great. Uh, and it's going to change our lifestyle. Uh, in fact, I'm now at the office and it's empty. You can see <laughs> there's no one at the back of my uh, at the back of the, of the screen. Um, and, and working remotely introduced a, a different set of challenges, and we're looking at that right now. Uh, while we are overcoming the current challenges, we want to make, it, make this to be a sustainable control environment. Uh, and we're also talking to the regulators. Look at you know what is the workforce will look like in future as when COVID-19 is is uh, hopefully controlled. Uh, and and now, you know, we expect this kind of work from home, work from home arrangement will continue uh, to what percentage, we don't know. Uh, in what shape and form, we don't know yet. Uh, so those are the things that, that we are working on. Uh, one last thing, so I just want to add, because of this work from home remote working that include our clients, our customers, so we are we're really expediting our uh, digitization journey. Uh, we, we don't have any more wet, wet ink signature uh, opportunity anymore. So we're moving fast uh, into uh, uh, digitization. Digital signature is one thing, electronic contract and so forth. So uh, I think this is the one benefit I'm seeing from COVID-19, pardon my, uh, the way I'm saying that, but it certainly help uh, us to uh, to shorten our journey from a five-year plan up into really like a year that we have to implement. Uh, so that's, that's my sharing for the time being. Thanks, Mickey. Uh, can we get uh, what's happening at Fidelity, Sam? Sure, thanks, Ben, and uh, good morning. It's uh, also good to be here. Um, a little bit different to Mickey's role. I'm in the first line. Uh, I cover Asia PAC, um, cybersecurity, information security, tech risk. Uh, the regulations are certainly a challenge, and um, what we've seen in the last few months is certainly, just like Mickey said, a rapid focus on digital transformation. Um, Speaking with a lot of uh, my counterparts and some of the people on this call as well, I know we've all been extremely busy, but I don't think any of us have actually been busy from dealing with COVID-related um, threats or phishing or anything like that. It's really about supporting our businesses mm. in that transformation journey, whether it be onboarding things like Zoom and WebEx or whatever it is. Mm. Maybe it's about changing our processes to be more online friendly as opposed to, de uh, as opposed to wet, uh, wet ink. All positive things, but it's certainly been a an increase in the business facing and you know supporting client and regulatory requirements that we're seeing. And so a little bit of our journey has been maybe a shift of focus from changing our priorities on you know improving our cybersecurity capabilities or the maturity of what we want to do as a team, and now really focusing on okay, how can we really truly enable our business to to work you know more effectively now into the future. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Hui, please. Okay, so I definitely uh, I definitely have a difference, okay, a role, okay, because uh, S3, the organization I'm in is an applied research institute. So we have multiple technologies, including communication like 5G, uh, um, and also uh, the IC design, the IoT sensor, and as well as the AIDB, and last but not uh, the, the, the least important is, of course, the security and the trust technology. So what is uh, we are I mean seeing right now is like this is okay right now the systems the applications are more the multidisciplinary uh, in nature with the cyber security as part of them and the trust and so on and of course I mean uh, this uh, reason of the this uh, COVID nineteen definitely will uh, I agree with the previous two speakers is about that is the digitization place is actually faster actually uh, in a lot of different uh, applications some of the people okay I'm, I'm talking about people now they are. Previously, are quite um, what I would say is like quite reluctant to take on new technologies. But right now, because of the COVID nineteen, because of the work from home, they, they they need to use them. But then, with, with more I mean experiences of these kind of people, they are now more willing to have the more digitized technology. But of course, I mean the the regulation side, the security technology side is is also uh, very important. So they are more aware of them. So what I will see is like this is actually, um, this is the time that actually cybersecurity has more opportunity than before. Because actually, to be honest, is the people are more aware of them and people will feel that it's more important. 
And of course, they are now not uh, in the office. In the office, it's very easy to keep things in a confidential, in a private way. But I mean, on the work from home, it is a little bit more difficult. But then force them to think about it and force them to adopt more technology and uh, regulation or other policy control. So I will, I will say it's like this is, uh, in, fact, in fact, this will be a better opportunity for cybersecurity industry to, I mean, to develop. Thank you, sir. Uh, Harry? Thanks, Bian. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Harry, representing from Microsoft and also from the Cyber Security Solutions Group inside Microsoft. So apparently, um, uh, this is a very special moment for all of us, um, not only for the uh, personal, the ones we care, the ones we need to take care of from the personal side and also from a work side, and there's a lot of uh, pressures and also I think that most of the speakers also mentioned about that. Uh, but uh, a little bit about uh, the, the, the practice we see from Microsoft Securities. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, um, we have uh, around 3,500 uh, pro security professionals around the world to keep up every day to help our customers, our internals, our partners to keep up for the security posture. A little bit of sharing that uh, particular moment. So uh, during this uh, particular moment, uh, we, we saw quite a fair bit of uh, uh, target attack, likely from a low-hanging fruit, like a phishing, uh, uh, a personal uh, email, which related to the COVID, uh, related health issues that uh, some, some we see a surge of this. And on the, uh, the other side, we see um, a lot of um, uh, work from home scenario that uh, I think the speaker also mentioned. Uh, definitely, a lot more to, we will discuss later on for this uh, 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 security situation uh, in, in this moment. And lastly, I also want to echo what, what the Dr. Lucas mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, in Chinese, we always say, if there is a risk, there is opportunity. So I want to uh, give one example, like um, we just uh, talked about those uh, challenging part, but we also see some business opportunity, like uh, some of our customers, they are more into personal health care. During this COVID, actually, we see that the demand and help the community for supplying some personal health care, surgical masks. So actually, that brings in a lot of uh, business for them. And actually, they, they're not just for the sake of uh, or the selling side, but also to serve the community. So we see that uh, based on the technology and based on the digital transformation, it helped them to achieve more. Uh, which is something we see um, the, the bright side of it. So um, be positive on that and we will have a lot of decision later on. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up, Mickey, and also to the other gentlemen in this panel. Uh, I think in the first quarter, there was this report about an increase in distributed denial of service attacks, which means that uh, this attack involves multiple connected other devices like uh, botnets, which are used to overwhelm a target website with traffic. Uh, this report, supposedly an international uh, report from Nexus Guard, I just want to know if uh, we saw this also in Hong Kong. Um, uh, I, I cannot, um, I don't have information in terms of specific for Hong Kong, uh, but definitely yes, when I, when I talk to my uh, peers in other banks and so forth, uh, well, and, um, well, unfortunately, all those are from global banks. Uh, we're actually seeing those traffic now. With with the the, the internet connection, uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint uh, for a specific specific country. Uh, the internet point of entry may not be in Hong Kong, uh, but could be somewhere else. But then the traffic could be lead, could be led into Hong Kong and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it definitely exists everywhere. That that's for sure. Uh, Harry. Sure. So, um, as, as mentioned, we, we got a team sitting uh, uh, from our security operation that uh, we have some sort of uh, security intelligence that can share. Uh, although I don't have immediate uh, uh, data for Hong Kong, but we see definitely the internet traffic plus some sort of like uh, attack from denial services is keep searching and keep keep up. Um, that maybe is with several reasons. Um, and other thing, maybe um, you can find this is also interesting. I also read some articles and analysis saying that because of COVID, uh, people are more tend to stay at home, uh, not only for work, sometimes they will uh, rely on internet. And yep. particularly for now, we have uh, internet over anything like gaming, video. Yep. And uh, if someone, maybe in Hong Kong, also popular, if uh, we just uh, easily download any um, uh, uh, apps on the internet without a proper uh, a published official from, from those store, that's if you install it, maybe some freebies, uh, you know if uh, anything is free, you are the product. So actually maybe they're leveraging the apps to do some more attack 
maybe maybe a hidden code that uh, you, your your computer, your device, your connected device could be uh, attacking, joining these kind of things to this unintentionally. So yes, definitely we see this a lot of uh, innovative way of attack from those uh, dark side. And it's not just uh, a big attack. Sometimes they just drip feed these attacks, and you never notice. Right. And I think it's become more distributed. That is not that means they use a bit of a lot of uh, resource from the from the back end, but maybe leveraging the consumer so consumer market or the device that we have to do a more distributed uh, uh, attack, or we are not intentionally being uh, abused and used by them. Uh, Doctor Hui. Uh uh, definitely, okay. Uh, right now, I don't have concrete uh, data, but I, I think it is also the reason, as Harry has mentioned about, is because actually the people are more work from home, so they are using their own uh, devices. Well, well, not only computer, you know, right now the, the using of the mobile phone or other device is very common. And we all know about that actually is within the organization, the office machines are easier to be protected because we can have a better policy and whatever. But however, if the people are using their device at home, well, they may be more careful in how they use it. So that's why, okay, actually it's more vulnerable to those kind of the DDoS or other attack and so on. So, um, but I, I think in this case, actually the, it is reflecting about our similar situation is like this is, uh, after this uh, COVID-19, the digitalization play, play, uh, place will be faster. But it also includes about a lot of, I mean, the people's home device or other devices. So in this case, uh, the people have to, I mean, tune their policy or control. So in this case, it's more suitable for this kind of the less potent machine. So that's my idea. Uh, Sam? Yeah, I have to reiterate what everyone else has already said here. Um, you know, for us, we were aware that DDoS was going to be um, a potential risk over the last uh, three to six months. Um, Fortunately, didn't come into fruition. Uh, I know we did see some cases in, uh, obviously, uh, in the US, and we saw some more recently in Australia, um, some very targeted kind of issues there. Um, but like everyone's already said, uh, for us, it is now thinking, and this one is, we're going to talk a bit about this later, it's now thinking about outside of our corporate environment. How do we help our staff just improve their awareness? How do we make sure we help them to understand that their personal environment um, helps them, uh, helps their families, and of course helps uh, the organisation. So that's the new frontier. Well, it's not really a new frontier, but certainly we expect that targeted attacks going to happen more at end users' devices, whether it's Alexa or Siri listening in, uh, whether it's physical security. There's a whole bunch of threats, that we now have we have a responsibility in a way to make sure staff are aware of the threats and uh, what they can do. And a follow up on. Just how businesses today can uh, enact, implement, and lay out really solid business continuity plans in the face of all these threats outside. Uh, in the, for example, in Fidelity, what are some of the things you're doing in terms of providing your customers and your organization uh, the proper business continuity plan? Sure. So um, we'll somewhat fortunate in our transformation and zoom for example has really enabled uh, us as an organization we were you know utilizing that and onboarding that uh, long before the pandemic um so we we're ahead of the curve but what we've seen is some organizations really suffered here because they cut corners they did not involve security and they said oh, we need to use this tool we need to use that tool and as a result they've had to unwind and make statements about it's not secure and it's maybe because they didn't engage the right teams or do the right analysis about what it may mean to them or their clients and so forth um, but for, for us it's really about making sure that security uh, or tech risk is engaged at the right time so if we are making changes we are looking at new tech that we are, you know, we are able to help them, be able to provide them support. Uh, and look, maybe we can make a risk decision on, hey, this is right, or maybe we can, you know, make some mitigating controls. But making sure, basically, that we're not going to be introducing new risk uh, without it being formally documented and managed and so forth. So making sure tech and security risk are all involved early in those conversations. Back to my earlier point, I think that's why a lot of us are so, so busy, because there's a lot of these kinds of things happening. Um, the other thing that um, that's working for us as well is, is ongoing testing, right? I, I think BCP, I think for us in Hong Kong, I think we've had an ongoing BCP scenario for over 12 months now. 
But I, yeah. but I really think making sure that the teams, the critical teams, our services are regularly tested um, because it's, it's great to have a plan. It's great to have, you know, um, protection. But unless you're testing on a regular basis and working yeah. the ins and outs, it's, you know, you never know. Uh, Harry, Microsoft is such a large organization and you have plenty of customers. So for business continuity plans, um, what are some of the things you've been doing and you've been helping your customers, partners to do? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I think uh, one, one thing I can share about is uh, like with, even within Microsoft ourselves, uh, I'm, I'm happy to share that uh, from, from our corporate down to our regional office, we uh, have this concepts which is uh, quite fully aware and uh, ready for this. Again, I think the keyword is this resilience, uh, which is quite aligned with our security practice. So what if something happened, we should do with that. But of course, we are extending this to our real life of the COVID situation right now. So take uh, Microsoft as example. Um, so uh, we, we treat uh, several things very important. And I think this is also a bit of tips of sharing to go deal with this COVID situation. Uh, several key points like uh, how to protect our employee at the free is a very crucial one because uh, I think everyone's agreed that uh, employees is a key asset for the company. So this is always, uh, the communication internally, how to give flexibility to employees. Uh, one thing I'm, I think we are very proud of it inside Microsoft. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, like we just mentioned, uh, we will uh, actually we set up a cross-functional uh, response team during this special moment. So uh, the again, the, this also consists of dealing with uh, uh, communication to internal to our partners and also to our, uh, um, our end customers. And, and also uh, another thing, I think uh, in no matter which business you're in, I think um, we are also doing some services or selling some products. So uh, uh, no matter how there should be some supply chain for each organization, um, uh, stabilizing the supply chain is also another key elements that we see how to maintain uh, the, uh, the product uh, availability and serving this uh, the the moment like uh, our cloud services as uh, uh, Sam just mentioned similar to us uh, we got a lot of customer asking for a uh, remote communication like using our Microsoft Teams as a collaboration tools so we see actually our, our, around these uh, few months we see around 600 percent growth for the demand and capacity so the supply chain which is our infrastructure our uh, all the resource behind we need to have a very special care to care so um, there will be a lot more, but I think um, uh, in short, um, starting from the, the human assets, starting from the communications, and then and then we can know uh, what is it. And also we'll stick with the plan and also uh, active communication is key, uh, not only to internal, but also to external as well. Dr. Hui, business continuity at the Astri, what are some of the things that you and your partners are collaborating with in terms of getting this done? <clears throat> Well, actually, I think I think this is quite. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, coming to the others, okay, it's like this is okay. We are keeping our, I mean, uh, our partners and our internal access actually as as the as the important access, so that we have all these kind of the BCP tanks over there. Uh, but to be honest, actually, uh, what I will say is like this is uh, for the medium size or larger size organization. I'm not that uh, worried about that. Actually, right now, if we are talking about this COVID nineteen, probably is are those small and SMEs, those are small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. But because what they have is like this, previously they are not that aware about the, I mean, the security importance. And, but of course, right now, because uh, they have all more work from home, and in some sense, it's their working partners, the different partner companies also work from home, so they are forced to be facing this problem. So what I would say is like this, is the more education, uh, as mentioned about the human factor, I think is still very important is how they will be more aware about the importance of this kind of, I mean, uh, new arrangements. And then what they have is like this, they can have to choose about the different types of some uh, simple cloud security technology or whatever, so that they can fit into the pictures of the whole ecosystem. So that is more important. And of course, uh, if you mentioned about, I mean, the medium size or the large size, okay, uh, the previous, okay, wisdoms of, I mean, the, the cybersecurity and the, I mean, PCP are already uh, quite, good and easy to adopt over there. So that's my opinion. Uh, Mickey? Um, yes, as, as Sam said earlier, um, we have been practicing BCP since 2019 because of the city unrest situations and so forth. So they give us uh, some lead way. 
But there are there are some now uh, uh, made a fundamental uh, shift in our approach in uh, business continuity measures in view of the COVID-19, and also perhaps moving forward, people will continue to work from home and so forth. Um, before 2019, we had a strategy to have one PC per user, and now we're moving into a strategy to have two connections per user. So uh, each user will have a laptop uh, so that they can come in through a secure remote VPN connection or uh, a, VP, a VDS uh, port uh, connection through a home device. So that will give uh, uh, a resiliency for each user, as Harry said earlier, resiliency is a key important thing. Uh, that's technology, the technological side of it. On the business side, uh, we have started splitting team, uh, splitting team in terms of across countries, across buildings, uh, and so forth. So, in fact, in 2019, we've mobilized our operations such that anywhere, uh, any branches can pick up the operations for Hong Kong branch if needed, provided Hong Kong MA approved and so forth. Um, so our book is regional. Uh, we can book uh, transactions anywhere. Uh, but now COVID-19 creates a challenge because it's not just in Hong Kong, <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, so, so now we're looking at really uh, distributing our transactions processing, not just within APEC region, but also to India, to Europe uh, and so forth into Poland. Uh, that will help us to have a good degree of resiliency. In working with clients, uh, WebEx is our tools, and of course, uh, pick the phone and with uh, digital uh, transformations and so forth. And our clients fully understand that the difficulties we have, and in fact, they also work from home as well. They don't want to see us in person, so they are quite happy <laughs> uh, to transact with us over uh, the phone. The major challenge we have right now is with trading floor. Uh, we cannot trade from home because of latency. Uh, and some uh, some regulators will not allow trading to be done at home as well. So uh, we have a limited amount of traders uh, that are in the office to do trading. And it, uh, we have also applied approval from different regulators to allow offshore trading as well. So, so that Singapore can trade for Hong Kong and vice versa and so forth. So that's, that's, that's our current setup. Um, and uh, moving forward, we'll exp explore more in terms of printing capabilities. Uh, we allow users to print at office. Uh, now, print from home, we cannot control what they print out. Uh, so we want to limit the uh, number of users who can print from home because in the view of uh, information data leakage. Uh, and, and so that's what we're doing right now. We're deploying tools to monitor print from home uh, so that we can at least review what ha what's being printed at home by the limited uh, set of users. Uh, and, and, and by doing that, we, we, we want to minimize our leakage exposure. So that's what we're doing right now in, in summary. Excellent. So uh, another, another thing that would be of interest to not only companies, but also individuals is, uh, especially the small companies, uh, is best practices. So uh, maybe we can start again with uh, Mickey. Well, probably your top three, five practices and responses is related to cybersecurity uh, and how they could be clearly communicated down the line to the whole organization. What are some of these, sir? Um, well, as, as, as Harry said earlier, uh, transparency and communication within the bank is very important. Uh, the way we management looks at work from home uh, and our strategy and our understanding and support of family being uh, uh, the first priority is very important. Uh, that will gain the, uh, our employees' uh, trust and confidence in working with us. Uh, having a, a work flexibility allow, allow employees to choose if they want to continue work from home or they want to come back to the office. In fact, we have done a, a survey, an interesting result I'm going to share here um, about, about intention to work from home and so forth. Um, the, the other thing that we're doing is that we have set up a well-being program uh, which uh, provides uh, expert help, whether it's uh, stress help, management, mental help, and so forth. Uh, if, if staff need to have to seek those uh, consultation, we'll provide uh, uh, services for them through, uh, through the expert and, uh, and, and, uh, and the psychiatrical help and so forth. Um, the, the, the third is really um, to uh, uh, look at uh, regulatory expectations in terms of the way we work from uh, in from work environment. Now, uh, with all that said, uh, before 2019, 
in fact, during 2019, we've moved moving aggressively to. Uh, I'm not. Well, I'm not. I'm saying this not because I want to do advertisement for Microsoft. But we're we're moving aggressively to uh, OS 365. Uh, for one very good reason, we want to leverage on uh, the uh, uh, vendor's resiliency uh, so that we can offload critical assets from our data centers and leveraging on what the vendor has spent in terms of the security uh, capacities and resiliency and so forth. Now, unfortunately, during COVID-19, when people work from home, uh, we have to put a stop on that because uh, migrating from uh, Office into 365 uh, will require an employee to be at Office so that it will be a lot faster uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so, for uh, I mean, a, a, a comment, a, a suggestions to SME, for example, I'm sure SME has been looking into various cloud opportunities, uh, and I'm sure they were leveraging on all those vendors. Uh, we should continue to do that, uh, and I and I believe the vendors, uh, while they are providing all those uh, um, uh, utility like, like computing infrastructure, uh, they will be spending a lot of effort and investment in securing that environment. And I'm sure Microsoft doesn't want the name to appear in, on, on Wall Street that they are being hacked. Uh, so, so we should leverage on that. And, 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 and there's a limit that we can spend as a company on security. But uh, I think a, a cloud vendor would have more a return if they invest more on security. Excellent. Sure. Sam? Sure. So maybe um, uh, adding to Mickey's list then, if I can, uh, if I was to add, say, um, three top um, uh, best practices, I'd say making sure your organization is using uh, recognized frameworks, industry frameworks, um, you know, depending on your maturity. Um, if you're a small organization, maybe just about going your after ISO 27001, or maybe it's about utilizing something a bit more mature as you progress, um, like NIST. I think um, regardless, um, you know, whether it's you in this pandemic or not, I think those things are still vitally uh, important. Uh, I've already said one um, before, but mm -hmm. testing, um, your, your response testing, um, right. putting BCP aside, uh, we talk about protection and that's great, but, but we've seen a lot of organisations suffer, not just the breach, but suffer because they've not been appropriately um, testing or they're not been appropriately planned, right? So uh, I really think testing your cyber defense plans or your cyber response plans uh, is really fundamental to making sure that you're able to, to handle an issue. Because it's not about if, it's about when, okay? And I think the final part, and Mickey, you, you touched on this in, in briefly, is vendors. And I think for us as large organizations, dealing with smaller organizations can pose a risk. And making sure you go through the appropriate due diligence and then keeping that engagement open and being able to react because maybe they've suffered some sort of an issue or maybe they've had a malware and they're sending, you know, uh, uh, malicious emails to you. How are you going to be able to react? How are you going to be able to make sure you're protecting them and also helping them, uh, sorry, protecting yourself, but also helping them uh, along the way? So I think. It, Regardless, I think focus on vendors is really, really crucial to making sure you as an organization and your clients are well protected. Uh, Dr. Hui? Yeah, I, I definitely support the idea of uh, you make use of the cloud I mean, based solutions provided by the vendors. Because, uh, I mean, the main part of the SME is the size of the company. They are not That's allowed right. to have a lot of, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, professional and technical persons to support. So it is better for them to depend on some large scale uh, investment so that they have a guarantee about the security. And of course, uh, there will be something like, I mean, uh, more about the people's awareness. That let's say, okay, uh, when they download the file, they did not distribute it uh, separately. Or uh, let's say in, if they are in a virtual meetings, okay, they have the backup to control about, uh, to check the participants one by one, so to ensure that there's no extra things or whatever. So those are the, uh, the more human side about that the small uh, SME uh, companies is able to be controlled. But for the technical side, I firmly believe that they should make use of those kind of the cloud solutions by vendors. This will be something that's easier. Harry? Yeah. Um, so for the best practices, I would like to share in the two folder. One is more from uh, from the business side or from the um, administration side of it and on the side cyber security part and also from the individual. Uh, rule number one, of course, uh, from the um, setup and I think uh, uh, we see a lot of uh, remote work right now. So turning on multi-factor authentication, MFA, uh, is crucial and this is what we recommend to all the organization. 
Uh, according to our statistics, it will reduce um, uh, 99 percent of those uh, identity theft. Secondly, um, the uh, and uh, as uh, we don't have the boundary of uh, network trust network corporate network right now because we're working remote. So um, that's why we see the identity is important as a new frontier of the parameters and the encryption part of it. Like we just talked about, uh, no matter the software file sharing, uh, video audio conferencing, uh, make sure you select something have the um, uh, uh, data in transit address and use. Uh, all the things has been encrypted uh, just gives you integrity on that and of course um, uh, we also need to keep good communication to our employees or maybe if you are managing the devices for your employee make sure they are up to speed for all the software side from the uh, individual i would say to, uh, uh, try to be say cautious um, uh, don't trust uh, don't don't ever trust any sources uh, need to verify you, you can trust but you need to verify this is a new term to talk about and also, uh, don't uh, keep update for your devices um, and, and such. Uh, don't click on any malicious links, something like that. So I think this is something we all know. In short, I would believe this is one principle, which is zero trust. We have been talking in the in the in the market. Um, so explicitly, uh, ex uh, explicitly verifying, give uh, the users with uh, enough, just enough uh, resource and just in time resource. And assume breach is something happens. We need to take uh, condition measures, and I like the point that uh, the, all, all the previous speaker mentioned. The last one I want to make is that um, uh, yes, um, we all talk about the people is a wicked thing. We need to be aware, but uh, for some uh, small organization, they may not be easy to uh, handle by this complex and ever changing cybersecurity landscape. So uh, the tools is a way to help them to accelerate and make them easier. So uh, happy to share like the example, not uh, a version, but I think the same as the other. Um, uh, cloud service provider, we also provide very hassle-free platform. Like for example, when I talk about the MFA and when I talk about the encryption, all these kind of things can be easily implemented from the cloud era. Rather than buying a software or pieces of hardware, you can fine tune and maintain by yourself. So again, uh, I think the tools is to leverage and are serious to. Excellent. I think a few years ago, I interviewed a network security CEO, and he mentioned to me, I was asking about the state of uh, investments in cybersecurity by some of the biggest companies, listed companies in Hong Kong. And he mentioned to me, and I thought it was a good quote, and I used it very often, is that most of these large companies in Hong Kong spend more for their Christmas party than for their <laughs> cybersecurity uh, structure. Uh, based on your experiences, sir, I would just like to know uh, just how do companies, especially the large ones, and if you can, also suggestions for the SMEs, how do you gauge the appropriate level of investment necessary for cybersecurity protection in the organization? Uh, maybe we could start off with Sam. Sure. So um, this kind of alludes to what I was mentioning before. I think it really depends on where you are in your maturity. Uh, obviously, if you are a smaller organization, um, maybe you need to look at the basics. But I, I think some key elements are making sure, and this is going to help with your budgets, making sure you've got a ring fence team. I think it's really important that you've got a security, uh, some responsible officer who's looking at this uh, separately from an IT manager. So I think it's really important to have that. I think it's also essential that the security budget is separated from technology. It shouldn't be Thanks, incorporated in there because it will just be, you know, it won't be, it won't be protected and, and, and something will always come along that's more important. Uh, the business may, may, may drive that. So I think it's really essential to having a, a ring fence budget. Uh, I've seen different numbers thrown around. Maybe it's 10% of tech. Maybe it's sort of half percent or 1% of your company's overall revenue. Um, but it really depends, uh, again, on where it is. But one thing I would say, uh, it's about making sure you get the most value out of it. And having the, the frameworks, which I mentioned before, and being able to identify your most important information assets can then help you to understand where you need to focus your efforts. So, uh, you know, understanding your own threat environment, understanding your control environment, and then understanding your information assets, hopefully then, with the limited resources and the budgets that you have, you can get the most value to make sure you're protecting the right stuff. 
Of course, you want to protect the whole organization. Of course, you want to improve the whole maturity. But with limited costs, sorry, limited budgets and people, maybe you need to go after the most crucial ones. Maybe your regulated um, systems, uh, maybe it's your client data, your trading systems, or whatever. But but those those prerequisites, the frameworks, the um, risk a uh, risk framework to understand. Uh, your information assets are really, really crucial to helping you drive the best value from your from, the, from your budget. Excellent, Mickey. Um, uh, Sam has covered all of that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, just just to add on to that, I think fully agree. Uh, understanding the uh, the risk and threats through assessment. Uh, so one suggestion is, um, uh, well, for, for banks in Hong Kong, I think we all know about the HKMA uh, CFI framework. Yes, uh, cool. It is actually a very good framework. Uh, so I would suggest even for non-banks, non-FI, maybe can use the framework as a reference and start to do all the uh, inherent assessment, maturity assessment. That will give you a good understanding in terms of your control gaps, your threat and your risk, and how do you prioritize your asset, and then determine your implementation plan. And hopefully by doing that, you can justify to your management, your board on the funding. Now, uh, uh, security budget is just like you know, buying insurance. Uh, it's non-quantifiable. I cannot say, well, if I spend $5, I will have $10 profit. I cannot do that. I hope I can say if I spend $5, I will protect your $10 asset. Uh, that makes sense. But if I spend $5 protecting $1 asset, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so those, that, that, I think that's what uh, Sam you did to earlier. Uh, make sure we prioritize. We focus on high priority item and focus on the key threat that you are, that we are concerned with. Uh, I mean, for example, I would presume most global organizations are very much concerned in terms of brand, reputation, and liability. Uh, nowadays, given the controls, given all the uh, cooperations by law enforcement, the, um, the magnitude of, of financial loss in any cyber attack is minimal. Uh, but then whenever there's a cyber attack, it will appear on all the media. Uh, and then the brand damage is unquantifiable. So those are the things. I'm not saying that we should scare our board, but those are the things they should recognize as well. And, and, and we cannot just say, okay, what's my return if I invest in this technology and so forth. And I think we should go back and say, here's what we're trying to protect. Here is what. Bian, uh, may I chime in to say something? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, I th uh, thanks for bringing this uh, topic about uh, the budget and the resources. You know, uh, uh, Microsoft deals with a lot of SMEs. So. Yeah, so so I think uh, uh, I hope uh, um, Nikki will come back soon and also say maybe have the get a lot. Uh, always say that do more with less, and plus now is uh, should be timely, <laughs> not just do more with less, but uh, we should be done the, yesterday, something like that. So um, my my point is um, uh, definitely we see that uh, come from some um, study we saw from the from from the uh, research. The uh, spending of IT is comparatively a uh, smaller portion than the, the I mean, in, in in the Asia, not only in Hong Kong, spending less than those in APEC. Yeah. Particularly in security is always. Uh, that's why I always respect to the the first line, second line, like um, Sam and Mickey. Uh, they they do all the things in the back end. Uh, people won't think about them until something happens and they have to fix it in short manner. So this is a challenge that we have. Um, so I think. Uh, back to basic, there's a quote always saying that security is, is a team sport. Right. So uh, not only from the suppliers, the external, the help the organization, uh, but I think uh, we also keep, need to keep, I, I think it's improving, but we need to keep uh, bringing these uh, security, cybersecurity topics to uh, different uh, level internally. Right. Not only just the uh, support from the uh, back end, but also from the front, uh, front uh, from the, the all the employees, yeah. even from the management, bring it as um, maybe a, a, a boardroom discussion. So I think uh, other than the uh, secure awareness to uh, every individual general, but uh, maybe there's some more, some more to be uh, discussed within those uh, management of each organization or business owner, the business decision maker, so that uh, again the resilience part to be in place. When they are aware of this, I think. This is the same as other topic from other business challenges, and then from uh, if we have coming to that point, point, I think the resources will be, will be getting more. Doctor Hui. Okay, I definitely okay. Uh, what I would say is like this is okay. Um, the people's concept have to be something like this is 
protecting about the cyber security is in fact protecting your business. So I totally agree that, okay, actually, uh, in fact, uh, this I mean, awareness uh, is best to be covered up from the top management. Because, okay, actually, from our experiences, for those companies that, okay, if their top man management are more aware about the risk and the business, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the damage, if there are something happens, they are more willing and actually their system are better and they have a better return. And another one I want to pinpoint is like this is, uh, there's a, a concept like this is, prevention is usually much better than recovery. So that's why it is better for them to invest. But of course, uh, I mean, as mentioned by previous speakers, uh, well, what is the percentage number? They need to have some objective. But I think that right now there are a lot of reports or whatever. Depending on the size of the company, they should have been able to find out some more intelligent guessing about what is the range they support. But the, the important one I would say still is like this, is it's better to attract about the board level or the top management so that they are awareness and to know that it's actually protecting cybersecurity, is protection of their business. Then these plans will go on. Excellent. Mickey, you were cut a bit there. Do you have anything more to add? Uh, yeah, yeah, so what, what's that? Is connected or, or somehow? There you go. You, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, well, just, just just to add on to that, um, uh, I fully agree. Uh, I just want to share that uh, 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 most most global banks uh, have cybersecurity as a topic in the board agenda, uh, and that will force uh, our board to understand uh, the risk and threat, uh, and for them to approve investment. Um, and there are certain regulations. I uh, I forgot which country. I think South Korea that they have a requirement that each organization should spend around five to 10% of the technology budget on security. Now, it's just a, a, a reference from the regulations. This is not, I, I do not mean that uh, spending 10% is good enough, uh, but it, that's a ballpark. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, just before we get questions from the audience, I'd just like to know if, uh, uh, my my Christmas tree anecdote uh, rings true uh, in your organizations right now. Please feel free to. <laughs> Mickey, uh, is that true? Uh, I, I wish we spend more Christmas dinner than security. <laughs> <There> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not true for us. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, no, not not at all. In, in fact, um, uh, in the recent three years, we are expanding more on our security uh, practice, but we have not been really advertising uh, or speaking about that. The more we talk, uh, the more attack we're inviting. So I'm going to keep quiet. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, Harry, is the Christmas tree anecdote, uh, does it ring true in your organization? Uh, luckily enough, uh, we are seeing the uh, uh, technology side from, from supplying to the technology to the market. So, uh, I think uh, we're quite well balanced. Indeed, I think, uh, uh, just a joke, I think uh, even our partners or, <laughs> or, or, or customers may want us to chime into their Christmas party. So uh, <laughs> we will be getting more. Less. Okay. And uh, Dr. Hui? And well, <laughs> <laughs> but de definitely, okay, uh, we, we are really focusing on the technology. So that's why actually, okay, on the different part of them, but uh, as a research institute, we are not only about uh, well, we protect our system, but at the same time, we also have allow a lot of flexibility for the staff to do a whatever of research. Okay. okay, safe answer. Very good. And Sam? Yeah, look, we've got a big program of work, so uh, our budgets have certainly not decreased. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I think uh, we're a few minutes up for uh, some questions from our attendees. Yes, thank you, Bien. So uh, th this first question we have from the audience here, uh, this comes from Florence Beals. This question is, which of the online meeting platforms is the most secure and why? Very uh, good. So I, 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 I'm, I'm going to bail you guys out a little bit here uh, from claiming whether there's one that's more secure than another. Feel free to note a specific one if you'd like to. But I'd add, I, I'd add to the question, though, myself, um, just to, to ask why meeting platforms are susceptible to cyber attacks. It's obvious there's been an uptick in this. Uh, due to the sheer quantity of online meetings happening over the course of this pandemic. So, uh, you know, what makes messaging service uh, more secure than another one? And, and what should organizations be doing about this? I guess we'll, we'll start with uh, start with Sam on this one. Yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, 
My view is that a lot of the noise uh, we saw about Zoom, I think, was a bit of sensationalism, to be quite frank. And I think it's a lot of people, a lot of organisations who were thrown into this environment and adding a tool, using a tool that had really no real idea about. And I think a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of options that people didn't really enable. And so they were very, very susceptible to issues. And this goes back to, I think, the repeating theme, what we've said here. So I think that that for me, for mine, was the, the biggest issue, uh, certainly around Zoom. We as an organisation, as I said, we use it. We do a lot of background uh, due diligence on it. We use Teams. We also use WebEx. So uh, we did a lot of work to get to that point where we understand the risks, understand where the enterprise controls are and how they operate, and we manage those tools effectively. And that's how we've managed uh, manage the risk, of course. And uh, Dr. Hui? Okay, I think I don't want to mention about any uh, any blank name or whatever. Yeah, but what I will say is like this is okay. Uh, just like other kinds of the uh, cyber security issues, uh, actually, if if the company sticks on uh, tools, they should be very aware about the recent news because you know about that. Okay, if there are certain there are some news, whatever instances, they should be able to be quickly respond to them. So what I will say is like this is okay. Uh, of course, okay, they can read on some reports or whatever to choose the best. Uh, currently available tools, but what they need to do is like they have to be, be flexible enough. So in the case, if there's something new or whatever, oh, they're okay. able to change to another one. So that is my opinion. And Harry? Yep. Um, so I think uh, back to what I just mentioned, um, technology is enabling for us uh, to do the work. So uh, in some point of time, some may ahead of the game, like uh, some features, some security measures, even to be honest, I'm putting out of my Microsoft hats uh, from other friendly competitors. I think they're doing a good job in increasing and also catching up the security part of it. But of course, it's for tips of the sharing. I would say that choosing a product security by design is important. And then the uh, the, the best practices or the, the way that to uh, use more of, uh, uh, security features like uh, uh, Sting mentioned about control of the security, control who is the joint meeting is also important. But I would want to add one more point. Uh, just, just rethink about it, that the, the, the video conferencing or the web conferencing is one way of the communication. That is what we are doing right now online. But don't forget to expand the remote. Well, actually, what about the file sharing, the collaboration of the data transfer between you know, internal, external party is also important. So I would say, uh, not just focus or just uh, obsess about the security integrity of that uh, video voice conferencing, but think through about what is your user is using and how and as an organization to 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 and and, and uh, embrace those security into it. So uh, yeah, so again, again, we um, I think we, we don't need to talk much about as uh, Mickey maybe also a good customer of us to say on behalf. So Mickey maybe get more information and sharing. Yeah, Mickey. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm not going to name the product <laughs> as well, uh, but I certainly echo what all the previous speakers have said. Uh, we've gone through a, a long, uh, I guess, assessment, evaluations of different tools before we arrive at the current uh, use. But in any case, uh, uh, it is very important for us to explain to our users why we select one but not the other, uh, and then pr provide a do's and don'ts. If a client comes in, they want to talk to us using the other two that we are not uh, selected, we've not selected, what should we do and so forth. Uh, we also remind users, you know, when we use any form of tools, uh, what do we present uh, on the sessions? Because what are we presenting here, we cannot uh, control the other end, whether they can take snapshot on the camera and so forth. So. Uh, uh, since we are all work from home, we'll be discussing a lot of very confidential uh, contract proposal discussions and so forth over WebEx and things like that. So it comes to the point that what Harry mentioned earlier, that how do we share those those confidential documents in a different secure channel as opposed to presenting uh, through a, a, a conferencing uh, media. So those are the things, the, the, the list of do's and don'ts is very important for us to produce and, and hopefully our staff will understand uh, and, and so forth. And then we need to monitor, uh, make sure uh, they cannot install other things that were not approved onto their company device. Okay, thanks. Another question from the audience here. This is from Alex Lee. Uh, COVID-19 has triggered more companies to move to a cloud-first strategy, uh, leveraging more SaaS-based solutions. So uh, what would each of you say are, let, let's just say the absolute top risk that needs to be managed uh, when adopting cloud-based solutions? Let's start with Harry on this one. 
Um, sure. So uh, I think uh, again, uh, when we move to cloud, most of the concern would be uh, the uh, privacy, the trustworthy of this cloud provider. So I think uh, as uh, most of the information is published published in the internet, uh, maybe from um, the decision maker from the organization can choose based on those uh, research and also do some more uh, uh, communication to uh, do the vendors before they uh, pursue that. Um, I, maybe I saw some some of the question as well, uh, asking whether uh, the digital transformation will slow down and reverse uh, back to normal after if the, everything resume. Uh, personally, I don't believe that because once you experience this, that would be the new normal that we talk about. So uh, again, I think um, the rule of thumb would be uh, uh, see more and do some more research and uh, even uh, most the benefit of this cloud is you can uh, at any time turn it on or even scaling down. So uh, even you may think it might not be suitable for you at late time, you can find a way that you can do an extra strategy of that. And uh, some even can overtrap by Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Green? Uh, I would say it's like this is okay. Uh, still, the, I mean, the human factor is the most vulnerable one. So even if you adopt a cloud I mean, strategies, if your I mean your, your employees are very really careful about sharing the password or even other kinds of the security, I mean information to the others, okay, and just pass them by uh, in a WhatsApp message, whatever, this is something that you you you, you cannot protect. So what we say is like this is um uh, in fact the cloud solution is a more manageable form, but still uh, the most vulnerability one is uh, about the human factor. So uh, you have to be let the company be let your employee to be aware of how they will use the technology uh, will keep in an overall I mean safe measure. So that's my idea. Okay, uh, Mickey. Um, I I guess the only thing I want to uh, uh, add on is um, I mean the the, I, I, the way I see it is the use of cloud is inevitable. This is a journey. Uh, as as a bank, we do not want to really maintain all those uh, IT assets within our book. Uh, and leverage on our partners providing us utilities. Um, and now it, it is very important uh, that we need to make sure uh, our there is a cloud roadmap within organizations. We cannot just, I don't think we can just jump from in-house uh, processing onto cloud in day one. So we should at least enable applications in-house to be cloud enabled. So start with perfect cloud and then move into hybrid cloud, and then move into public cloud, depending on the criticality of asset and information and so forth. And of course, regulatory approval. So that's that's uh, that's other things I would like to add. And Sam? Look, uh, not to great everybody, but uh, to single out the one thing that Mickey just finished on, the regulatory understanding, I think that's in Asia PAC, that's the challenge at the moment. Okay, great. So another question from the audience here, and this is probably gonna have to be our last one due to the amount of time that we have. Uh, and I'm going to combine two questions here. So the, this first one, uh, can you share a bit more about mobile device management, especially for SME staff uh, who are using mobile devices? And then another question that I'll just lump onto this. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, during the panel that there's potential security risk from always on devices like uh, Alexa or Siri, for example. Um, you know, is there also concern with regards to companies uh, forcing such software upon customers? Uh, so let's uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Hui on this one. Okay, uh, if you're talking about I mean the mobile device like mobile phone, okay, what I will say is like this: probably you will have the I mean the, the culture as uh, the people will be having okay two separate mobile device, one just for the work and one is for their other kinds of the, the activities. Because if it's not the case, okay, it will be make complicated problems a lot. But of course, uh, the others is I mean the. The the the, uh, the mobile device is uh, just I mean uh, what you have is I think you have to be I mean download the software the apps okay from the reliable sources and make the uh, most updated version those kind of the common kinds of the practice for the cybersecurity they have to be keep up of of them but of course as I mentioned if they can separate out about when it's for the working environment when it's for their daily life it will make the management much easier. Okay, uh, Sam. Oh, this is, a, you know, really up to the organizations and their capabilities to make sure that they are able to apply enterprise control. So that's why maybe they utilize or they prefer to use Windows devices. Um, or maybe that's how they apply the BYOD management 
or whatever it is. I guess the key thing is, um, you know, making sure your your policies within your organization allow for being able to remotely wipe, being able to manage a device, being able to manage the application, manage the data is absolutely essential. So it doesn't matter. I don't, doesn't matter what operating system it ends up on, providing the data can be managed by the organization is absolutely the key factor. Uh, Mickey. Uh, that's, this is actually an interesting topic. Um, uh, we have, well, we follow largely the BYOD standard from HKMA. Um, so we, we, ha we have two options. Uh, one is, as, as Dr. Hui said earlier, uh, to provide corporate devices uh, such that we can control the device what software can be implemented and so forth. And then we also recognize the fact that young generations living there, they will come in with a BYOD concept. Why can I use my own device to operate? So we want to support that as well. And it's also a, a, a voice from a client that how come you bank are so behind? Why can't I use my Mac <laughs> to, uh, to process and so forth? So we recognize that. So we have spent a lot of time looking at different sandbox technology. So we allow the use of mobile device, the personal device to access bank information, but with only the specific applications that we can sandbox the information that we cannot you know, uh, store information on their local device. With all that said, now we need, we need to look at the strategy because, because of the uh, Hong Kong Autonomy Act from US. Uh, well, we don't have time to discuss anyway, but uh, we may want to go back to what Dr. Hui said earlier to implement, to install, well, to provide uh, staff who need access mobile with corporate devices such that we can remove all other social media platforms from those devices and so forth. And then we control information on that. So that's my sharing. Thanks, Mickey. And then Harry for our, our final comment. Yeah, I try to be a quick one. So I try to address the two uh, questions uh, in combined. So um, if you're really concerned about those uh, privacy and also your own work stuff, like me, the two devices. Uh, but um, you know, uh, with the technology right now, we can uh, I think not only for the MDM part, the, the managed device, but also the managed application can do a balance between what uh, don't don't affect your personal use of your devices, but you still can comply to the company uh, wise of, of the usage. So uh, I think the technology can handle this part. Secondly, for these uh, connected device, always on devices, uh, I think some some names like uh, Alexa, maybe uh, uh, Con uh, Contora, like Microsoft, and also maybe uh, Siri. So uh, in the market, I think on behalf of those uh, in the industry technology uh, enabler, I would say uh, some terms like responsible or uh, something called responsible AI. So I believe uh, that in the market, we also uh, incorporate and adopt something which uh, won't uh, uh, in, in intricate also the uh, in uh, get the uh, AI or the privacy into in this topic. But for course of time, that would be something we can like uh, spin up and talk about next time. But I think uh, just in short, uh, this is all up to us how to leverage the technology. Thanks, Harry. All right. Well, that is all the time we have. Unfortunately, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their time and insights to our webinar today. Thank you to BM for his moderation. Uh, to our audience, if you're interested to learn more about uh, cybersecurity, uh, Microsoft is also conducting a webinar series called Cybersecurity for Your Business. For more details on that, you can scan the QR code that you see on your screen. Uh, lastly, the next segment in our Digital Transformation Series will be held on September 17th on the topic of how 5G will revolutionize the workforce. For more details, you can visit our series website at digitaltransformation.hk, or you can also scan the QR code on your screen. We'd like to give a big thanks to our sponsors again, Xi'an High International Liaison Services Limited and Microsoft. And of course, a big thanks to all of you who have tuned in to watch. We hope you enjoyed today's segment and we look forward to welcoming you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank thanks. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.